Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. This is our ninth stream, I believe, and we're talking about pitching your idea or cartoon or project to uh, executives and studios, which uh, both Jorge and I have a have a good experience with that, and and we can help you out today. <laughs> yes. um, first of all, Jorge, how are you? I am. Uh, I am uh, super happy, super honored to be here. Nico, you know, we've been for a while, so thank you for, yeah. for asking me. Uh, CTN and Tina, thank you. So, thank you guys. We're, um, you're, you're, uh, if, uh, if you can talk about uh, as much as you can talk about, you're currently uh, working on, on, on Maya, right? At Netflix. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm currently in Netflix Animation, uh, working on uh, my, you know, Latino Lord of the Rings uh, giant limited series uh, <laughs> slated for fall of next year. Great. Uh, and, and I'll tease this. Uh, I'll say anybody who liked the voice cast in El Tigre and the Book of Life, you're really going to like the voice cast. Oh, in, cool. Uh, so that's all I'll say. <laughs> Great. <laughs> cool. Um, uh, I, I'm sure everyone here, oh, Parker says El Tigre is a huge inspiration. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, uh, I'm sure most people in the chat here, uh, you know, know of you to some extent. But but please, uh, for a few minutes, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about your career and how sure. you got started? And uh, I mean, I, we have we have time, and, and yeah. obviously we're going to be talking about pitching. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I'll, I'll just go really fast. I'm originally from Mexico City. Uh, I grew up in Tijuana. I was very, very, very lucky, uh, and I got into Cal Arts when I was 17. And that that kind of changed my life as a Mexican kid, and I didn't have enough money, or my parents didn't have enough money to go there. But uh, the I got scholarships, and the Mexican government gave me scholarships. Back then, the, the Mexican government still uh, believed in the arts a lot more. <laughs> uh, and I, uh, I was very lucky. I went there for six years. I did my bachelor's and my master's. Uh, then I graduated and you know what happens to uh, foreign students in the US is you get one year to find a job mm. or you get deported and so uh, you know our motivation is very different yeah. than, other, than other kids uh. Uh, especially for someone like me who said well you know if I I'm so close in Tijuana I'm so close to LA and I'm so close to to Emerald City uh, if I don't find a job I'm gonna get deported so that's just and like I'm terrifying yeah, yeah, it's terrifying. I'm going to be the, you know, the best animator taco stand uh, guy <laughs> in all of Tijuana. So I, uh, I tried really hard to get a job and all my, all my, um, all my work pretty much looked like Mexican stuff uh, because that's the stuff I always loved. Uh, and, uh, and I got rejected everywhere, every studio, every, uh, every place uh, turned me down, told me my stuff uh, was good and cool, but we don't make stuff like this here. Um, and, uh, I had made a little student short and I remember, uh, at that time, uh, I'm still with him. My manager, Aaron Berger signed me and he said, Hey, your student short won an Emmy, uh, write a movie and I'll send you to all the studios to pitch it because you oh. won a student Emmy. And it just seemed like such a logical and easy thing. So <laughs> I bought a, how to write a screenplay book, uh, how to write a movie in 28 days. Uh, and it took me a little over 28 days. Wow. I wrote the first, you know, 35 page outline of Book of Life. And he, sure enough, he sent me to all the studios, Disney, DreamWorks, Fox, every studio in town. Uh, and I got, that was a sort of a crash course in pitching for the first time, right? Like going in there, being super intimidated. Obviously I wasn't meeting with high level executives. I was pretty much pitching to junior executives. Mm. Uh, the, way, the way it worked back then, this is you know, early 2000s, I think it's kind of the same now. You basically pitch to the bottom of the mm. hierarchy and once someone likes it, they pitch it, you get to pitch it to their boss and then their boss and then their boss and eventually you pitch to a room full of uh, people who say, oh, we can market this movie, we can do consumer products in this movie, we can produce this movie. Uh, so that was a... a, a a very interesting thing to go through. Uh, I got my ass handed to me. And basically everybody told me, uh, you're just a dumb kid out of school. You have no experience to direct a movie. Uh, no one wants to see a movie about uh, dead Mexicans. And you need, this is year 2000, right? You need more experience. And I think they were right about two of those three. 
<laughs> I'm just a dumb kid out of school. I was. And you need more experience. So uh, eventually there was a producer at Nickelodeon. I was showing him my work. Uh, and by the way, I, you know, you get rejection for everybody who's just graduated, for everybody who's starting. Not only is it normal, mm-hmm. but it's kind of what makes you stronger. Yeah. Every time you yeah. get rejected, you just get, you just power up. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. I found, uh, I found myself looking forward to right. rejection because I'm like, hey, it's just going to make me that much more motivated and stronger. Yep. And, and how, do I, how do I take this as a learning experience? Because you learn nothing from success, right? Yeah. You only learn from, from failure, basically. Yeah. So uh, that, this producer said, hey, I love your work, um, but I'm not going to hire you because our show doesn't look like this. But I'm going to give you some advice. And he, he closed the door and I was like, oh, here comes the meaning of life. Here it comes. <laughs> right? Everybody's looking for that tip, that tip that can like get you over the hump. Yeah. And he goes, the only person, and he kind of whispered it. He's like, the only person who's going to hire you is you. Huh. And I was like, what? And he goes, <laughs> yeah, you have to be sitting where I'm sitting. You have to be the show creator. You have to be the executive producer. You have to be the person in charge. Okay. So go out there and just pitch. Pitch, pitch, pitch. Pitch shows about all the stuff you've shown me, all the stories you've told me. Just pitch that stuff. So I did exactly that. I started, uh, I saw all these internet cartoons at the time. Uh, I learned Flash. I got a you know pirate version of Flash because I was a student. I, never, I didn't have any money. Uh, I worked super hard for, you know, after spending three years doing a student short, uh, I spent maybe two, three weeks doing this tiny little short. Uh, you said this is I, early 2000s? Early 2000s. I put it up online. It was called El Macho versus the Mariachis of Doom. And that was the biggest lesson I found. You can tell people, hey, I can make cartoons or hey, I can be funny. But it doesn't mean anything if you don't have the thing. So if I said, hey, I have a show about a Mexican wrestler that is really funny, people would go, and? <laughs> and I would go, here's a link. You could watch an episode of it. They would watch it and they would go, oh, I get it. And obviously if they liked it, then that was the thing that I promised and I delivered on. So Sony Pictures, I uploaded the short uh, to a site where you could just upload. It was like YouTube before YouTube. Uh, and it got 20,000 views in one night, which is crazy for the year 2000. <laughs> so I had done an internship at Sony a year earlier. Those producers basically saw that, uh, that short and said, hey, we want to sponsor your visa and we want to buy uh, 20 episodes. And that was it. That was the, I <laughs> thought, this is the greatest country on earth. They just, uh, <laughs> they just let you do whatever you want. So that was, that was the best and worst thing that happened to me because I thought, oh, my first try, I sold my show. So I, that's not obviously normal. And sure enough, uh, after my show was canceled, after 9-11, thanks to having made a show for Sony, all the TV doors kind of opened and all the development people were like, oh, you had your own show at uh, Sony. What pitches your TV show? So I went to Cartoon Network, Warner Brothers, you know, Nickelodeon, El Tigre, I pitched to an executive at Disney, uh, Peter Gal, who now runs the, the series division at, at DreamWorks. He was a, a, a development executive back then. I pitched them uh, a show, they optioned it. Again, once you get a show option at a big name studio, all of a sudden all the other studios go, do you have anything else? Mm-hmm. Because what if you're the next Steve Spielberg or what if you're the next you know, Craig McCracken? Uh, so we would get other shows optioned by other studios just to see if our thing went through or not. It was almost like they were, they were uh, lay, doing layaway, talent layaway. <laughs> so uh, we killed ourselves, you know, first time directing a pilot for Disney. It doesn't go. Pilot for uh, Warner Brothers or Kids WB back then. Oh, yeah. It doesn't go. And then at that point, we had a show in development at Nickelodeon, which was El Tigre, uh, my wife and I. And that was the moment where we said, all right, if this doesn't go, we're screwed. Uh, I remember Fred Seibert had told me, if you have three pilots and all three don't go, you struck out, right? Such a, such a baseball metaphor. <laughs> uh, 
So thankfully, El Tigre went through. Oh my God, we you know had the time of our lives doing El Tigre. El Tigre gets canceled after one season set, but thanks to that, it won seven Emmys in yeah. one year, which is fucking a record. Uh, and doors opened, uh, and DreamWorks uh, basically asked me, "Hey, do you have? We want to make a Day of the Dead movie. Uh, do you have any <laughs> ideas?" And I turn in the exact same document, the exact same document they had rejected uh, seven Emmys ago. Uh, or, <laughs> and they had said it's amateurish, macabre, and weird. And it, you know, I literally ripped that page off, wrote a new page, changed the date, turned in the exact same wow. document. That's how cynical I was. Uh, <laughs> they read it and they were like, oh, it's inventive and magical and totally, like nothing we've yeah. ever seen. So then I do development there for a year uh, on Book of Life. Uh, and then obviously it didn't, it didn't go at DreamWorks. Uh, a year after I was there doing development, uh, B-Movie came out and then B-Movie did not do very well. Uh, so they changed uh, development executives. I'll say it like that. Yeah. Uh, they brought in new, new, new regime comes in because that's the other thing in development. Yeah. You're at the mercy of, of who's in charge and, the old regime doesn't want to give success to the previous regime. Like, obviously, politics are a big part of our world. They sure are a big part of Hollywood, and they sure are a big part of animation. So uh, new regime comes in, and they say, hey, in order for Book of Life to move forward, uh, we have some notes. We, uh, one, uh, can't take place in Mexico. Main character can't be a bullfighter. And uh, he can't die. Boy, so boy. Here, he, yeah. So here I am in the room going, wait a second. My movie's about a Mexican bullfighter who dies. <laughs> so they I mean, said, it's Day uh, of the Dead. It, How can yeah, you not die? Right? <laughs> so then they go, in order Why for this... Why can't it take place in Mexico? Uh, people can't relate to people in Mexico, right? That, that was a okay. note. So in order for this movie to move forward, it's got to take place in present-day urban New York. It's got um, oh. to be uh, take place in... Uh, Washington Heights. I didn't even know what Washington Heights was. <laughs> and for those who are guessing, we want to pair you up with, and I still remember the executive reading it from a piece of paper. We want to pair you up with Lynn Manuel Miranda. And we want your movie to be a hip hop salsa musical. So I quit on the spot. I was like, that's not my movie. Good call. Uh, and I even <laughs> said, like, and you tell, you tell Lynn Malaran Miranda or whatever her name is. That, <laughs> that has nothing to do with my movie. Uh, <laughs> so thankfully, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg was very nice and gave me my rights back because uh, I didn't sell my rights, right? You know, and we can talk about that later. But I basically, uh, the way TV animation works is they option your idea. They basically rent your idea. And if it goes to series, they buy your idea. Mm -hmm. You don't own your idea. Yeah. Uh, in feature animation, it's very much the same. You, you pitch your idea, they option it, and then if a movie gets produced, they buy the movie, right? They literally buy the IP. So like Brad Bird doesn't own The Incredibles. Mm -hmm. or, you know, no, no one owns their movies. Yeah. So uh, I was either the smartest or the dumbest person in the universe because when uh, DreamWorks wanted Book of Life, I chose not to sell it. I just said, I'll just do an option because I don't know if you guys will ever make this movie and I want to make sure I, I get it back. Well, Jeffrey honored that agreement, gave me my rights back and gave me a bunch of sorry, didn't work out money. Wow. Uh, and I asked him, like, Jeffrey, what? why would you do this? <laughs> and lesson number one from Jeffrey Katzenberg, he goes, because you're going to tell the story of how kind I was to you. And what am I doing right now? Yeah. <laughs> so he got his money's worth. Yeah. Uh, so then uh, I get my rights back. Things are looking grim. Uh, we do another pilot for Disney. We do another pilot for Nickelodeon. Uh, they don't seem to go. And then out of nowhere, uh, Book of Life happens with a studio that had never made a movie before, Real Effects. They said, we don't have $180 million, which was the, you know, the DreamWorks budget mm -hmm. back then. Uh, but we have, uh, we have $25 million. <laughs> uh, and we think we can make your movie for 50. So uh, if you can help find the other 25, uh, we will believe in you and trust you to write it and direct it. So I hired my friend, uh, Doug Langdale, who had been the head writer in El Tigre to co-write the script with me. And we moved to Dallas. We moved to Texas. Yeah. And, you know, I found it very ironic that I had to leave. 
had to leave Mexico to make Mexican cartoons. <laughs> and then I had to leave Hollywood to make a Hollywood movie. <laughs> so we moved to Texas, uh, worked there for a year. And I'm going to tell you guys my first ever, uh, my Guillermo del Toro pitch story that I promised on Twitter that I was going to tell. So after working on that Book of Life script for a year, doing all the character designs, doing nine paintings with a production designer and uh, art director, Paul Sullivan and Timo Morella, my wife, Sandra, designs all the girls. Uh, we write the script. I, I killed myself on this thing. Um, they asked me, who would be your dream producer? Oh, Guillermo del Toro, you know, <laughs> for, for any Mexican, especially a, a fat Mexican like me, he is my God, right? I, I worship Guillermo. So I'm like, Guillermo would be the most fantastic producer in the universe. Uh, we try to get to him through his manager, through his lawyer, through his literally everybody. And he keeps saying, no, no, no. Yeah. One of our producers had worked with him on Mimic, somehow got us a meeting and he didn't show up. Then he, oh. we get another meeting and then he shows up. And when we're there, he gets in his car and drives off. And this happened 15 times. He basically uh, left me. It's like a, like, a, like a date where the other person doesn't show up or shows up, sees you, and runs away. That's wow. what they felt like. So 15 rejections. Uh, the, uh, and, you know, we're friends now, so I, I, I can tell these stories. I, I freaking <laughs> analyze Guillermo. Uh, so after 15 meetings, they're like, Jorge, we got to move on. We got go, to get another producer because this movie's stalling. Um, so finally, cool. Guillermo said, all right, bring him to my house. And I will say no to his face, so he stops bothering me. <laughs> so we, we drive to his house. Back then, he had two mansions, well, two houses, uh, one where he lived with his daughters and one where he has his amazing collection of art and animation, uh, memorabilia, all the you know, movie props from lots of movies, all his amazing props from his movies. Uh, I think in the Kronos Blu-ray, you can see uh, Bleak House and you get a tour of it. It's incredible. And all those Guillermo del Toro exhibits going around the world, that's like a, that's like 30% of his Yeah, house. yeah. I it's, went to LACMA when they had his, oh yeah. his it's, exhibit. It's, it's like, it's, this is just a, a bunch of stuff from his house. And it's just right. like, yeah, old movie props and amazing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just stunning. So we, we go over there. It's August. It's super hot. All right. So over 100 degrees. Uh, the door open. We, we drive past his house. And the only reason I mean, knew it was his house is because he had a Hellboy toy in, a, <laughs> in his car. So we're like, that's the house. So we go in there, <laughs> knock on the door. And I'm used to like, I'm used to the Guillermo from Comic-Con and presentations and audio commentaries. Yeah. Just like joyous yeah. Mexican Santa Claus. <laughs> that, is, that is not the Guillermo I met that evening. Uh, so I go in there and he did not look very happy. He was kind of like judging me uh because he gets a lot of stuff pitched right and so he can't he can't be that open uh he, he has to be very guarded and it's for his own good so we go in there they had told me you have 30 minutes to pitch to him so we had maquettes of the characters we had nine paintings uh you know the script we had everything ready were you sweating bullets oh my god i'm you know it's like <laughs> for me it was like literally meeting, not only meeting my hero, but trying to convince my hero to go on an adventure with me. That's yeah. what it felt like. Wow. So <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm super nervous. And they said, he's going to give you 30 minutes to pitch, pitch the movie. So I've been practicing for months, this pitch. Like I have this thing down. Uh, there's so much incredible art in his house that we make the horrible decision to pitch outside in the sun so that the maquettes and the sculptures aren't overshadowed by, you know, original Mary Blair's and like, yeah. <laughs> or like original uh, Harry Housen. Like, it's insane the stuff he has in there, right? So we go outside, we set everything up. Um, I, I, he, you know, he basically goes, all right, pitch. I'll plunge the trees aside. I take the the most important breath of my whole life, right? <laughs> I, I basically summon my ancestors. Ancestors! Give me the strength! <laughs> yeah. And just as the first words are going to come out of my mouth, he goes, Gordo! Which is a, you know, affectionate term yeah. uh, amongst chubby Mexicans. <laughs> Gordo! You have five minutes! So I'm like, five minutes? Like, what happened to the 30? Five minutes, Gordo! Wow. 
That's my Guillermo impression. Uh, so I'm like, all right, all right, I can do this. I can do this. And that starts, give me the strength. And I kid you not, as I take perhaps the most important breath of my whole entire life, my people betray me in the mansion next door. There's three gardeners with giant lawnmowers. And it was oh, all like they were waiting. And they saw my mouth open oh. and they go, all out of the way. Yeah. And a oh. wave of sound. <laughs> it's hitting, right? So I, I, I look at Guillermo with you know, beautiful eyes. I go, Guillermo, <laughs> do we wait till they finish? And he just deadpan, like straight, looks through my soul and just waits. And he goes, Gordo, four minutes. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Oh. So I jumped into the ring and I pitched my heart out for four minutes, right? Because I'm, you know, I'm an animator, so I time these things. I pitched as hard as I could, yelling. You know, Book of Life is a very tender movie. So imagine the yelled version of all the tender, yeah. <laughs> fast forward version of the movie. <laughs> he apologizes to a ball. <laughs> and then, like, I'm like spitting, I'm sweating, I'm drenched. I'm like about to fall into the pool and people are holding me back. One of our producers like is watching this and he was like, I, I can't, I can't. And he just left. Like it was, it was a train, it was like a train wreck with a, with a airplane wreck and a car wreck. All <laughs> up into the so I finish and I'm drenched and he's laughing, but he is definitely not laughing at any of the jokes. He is laughing at what a disaster this was. So all the producers are like, just go in there and say goodbye and we'll clean up. Oh, I basically, uh, heartbreaking. literally, <laughs> I pooped the bed. So we go inside of his house. I sit down and I tell him, yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I wasted your time. I, you know, I'm looking for some hope, right? Before yeah. I leave, like, please give me some wisdom before I leave. And I go, yeah, I'm so sorry I wasted your time. I know that wasn't you know, I, I know that wasn't such a good pitch. And he goes, not a good pitch. Gordo, that was the shittiest pitch I've ever seen. Ever. And I've seen some shit. Oh. <laughs> so I stand up and I'm like, ah, well, thank you so much for your time. It was an honor yeah. to meet you. You know, you are a huge influence on me. He didn't even let me finish. He goes, sit down. <laughs> and I, I mean, I'm shaking and he goes, Gordo. I have two daughters. Every Saturday morning, we would watch El Tigre together. I know your cartoon. I know your sense of humor. I know how you think. And the most important thing is, I can tell by that show how much you love our culture. Of course, I'm going to produce your movie. Right? So That's I'm a shocked I pee <laughs> pee my pants right but I'm so sweaty that no one can tell or I hope no one can tell uh, I stand up he stands up I hug him right our liquids combined I hug, like I feel like his DNA rubbed all over me oh. we became one for a split second that hot man and liquid he, he pushes me away and he goes oh. this is important for all, all filmmakers especially those who want to make their movies did you write the script? And he said this, if you didn't write the script, you're not a real director. <laughs> so I'm like, no, 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 I wrote the script. I wrote the script with, you know, Doug Lindell. So I run to my car. We'd gone to a wedding. I had the script there. At the wedding, they gave uh, tequila bottles to the guests, right, Mexican wedding. Uh, the tequila bottle broke and my, and my script was drenched in tequila oh, from the night before. <laughs> so it was, all, it was like used toilet paper. So I grab, I grab the script and I'm running and I'm blowing on it and I run through it and it was like, you know, like a knight giving a sword to the king, right? I'm like, my leash. And he, gra he grabs the script with his like, you know, beautiful meaty hands. <laughs> and he like looks at it and he smells it. <laughs> and he goes, mm, Gordo, that's a good script. <laughs> and that was it. He became... He became the producer of Book of Life. Wow. And uh, 
Book of Life changed my life. That was the beginning <laughs> of, of uh, a whole new journey. And by the way, <laughs> pitching that pitching that now, I basically pitch you guys a moment. Yeah. Right? That this is pitching. That's kind of the part of the process. Uh, you, you know, beginning setup, beginning, uh, yeah. unexpected, all is lost, uh, climax, <laughs> all is lost. Yeah, yeah, happy yeah. ending. Happy ending. <laughs> And How? you guys know that Guillermo produced Book of Life. I know that most of you guys know that. Mm -hmm. So I have to hide the ending. Yeah. Because it's a given, <laughs> right? It's like making a historical movie where obviously you know what happened. Uh, so Book of Life uh, finished. Uh, wow. I did what a bunch a story. of story. I did a bunch of other stuff. Uh, I did a, a virtual reality thing with Google called Son of Jaguar. I encourage everybody. Who hasn't tried it out? Try it mm -hmm. out. That was uh, really man, fun. I, uh, you know, I'm a big, huge fan of Chris uh, Miller and Phil Lord, the Lego Movie directors, uh, and they, they and the producer Dan Lin uh, invited me to play in the uh, Lego uh, Lego Movie universe, and I was super excited to work with those guys and learn as much as I could. And and I was there nine months, and I learned a ton from them. Uh, so I feel very lucky that I've gotten to work with Guillermo and. Uh, oh. Phil. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the, the Lego movies uh, went away from Warner Brothers. Uh, mm -hmm. Those movies stopped being made over there. Uh, I quit when my movie over there uh, was getting to a point where it was becoming something that I wasn't comfortable with. That's all I'll say. Uh, and then uh, and then Netflix. Netflix mm -hmm. came to me. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, you know, incredibly thankful for the opportunity that I was given. Uh, Melissa Cobb and, and and everybody at Netflix Animation, uh, you know, it was like joining the Justice League, seeing all these yeah. directors and creators. It's kind of kind of crazy. Uh, they sat me down and they said, uh, "Pitch us something you don't think you can get made anywhere." Which, so, so they approached you, yeah, to, to pitch. Okay. And uh, and I have to thank you know Shannon Tyndall and Mark Osborne and all those guys because. Literally, Shannon posted a picture of all of us having dinner, uh, trying to figure out what the hell to do next. And Melissa Cobb saw the picture and said, we should talk. Uh, <laughs> so thank you to social media, thank yeah. you Twitter, thank you uh, <laughs> Shannon Tindall. Um, and, and I pitched Maya, right? And, yeah, and no. my pitch, my, you know, I can't talk about the specifics, but mm. my pitch with Maya was, I love fantasy. I love Game of Thrones and I love Lord of the Rings and, and I love, Dungeons and Dragons, but people in those things, it's always a European version of fantasy. Yeah. Uh, I never get to see uh, Latin America. And I never get to see people like me. And, and I'm pretty sure if you spun the world uh, of those movies and then those universes, there's brown people somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, it's all fantasy anyways. Mm. This is, these are not historical things. So uh, if you guys believe in me, let me make, uh, I, you know, I've been lucky I made a TV show. I've been lucky I made a movie. Let me make something in the middle. Let mm. me make a limited series. That's basically a four and a half hour movie. Mm. Let me tell a sprawling story. Because when you, when you make a movie, you leave at least at least one movie on the cutting room floor. Yeah. And when you make a TV show, you're making episodic things. So mm -hmm. the, the arcs are different, the, you know, the, the stories are different. Let me do something in the middle. I can make a TV show at another studio. I can make a movie at another studio. Let me make the thing that you guys are amazing at. Yeah. And so uh, they, you know, it was, it was, it was a match made in heaven. Yeah. Uh, and they, they really trusted and believed in us. Uh, and I got to hire a lot of people from Book of Life, and I got to hire a lot of people from El Tigre, and I got to basically bring together everything I had learned up to this point uh, from Maya, and then I'm working on a bunch of other stuff that hasn't been announced mm -hmm. that I am <laughs> giddy, just giddy uh, about. Uh, and that then brings me to here. Are you, are you able to say if uh, Guillermo is involved in anything well, I mean, Guillermo, uh, as a lot of you know, Guillermo will only produce first-time directors. Okay. Uh, so I love him and I adore him. And, and, you know, he's become a mentor and a friend and someone I, I show stuff to uh, whenever I can. But he, uh, he basically said, it's your turn. It's your turn to help others. Uh, cool. I will. I will uh, that's how you pay me back. Wow. And I love that. 
Yeah. <laughs> As you know, I'm also a Netflix, but I wanted to chime in and just say like, it felt like a, it felt like we were all like on like a desert island and Netflix is this big ship that showed up and took us all in and like saved us and got us <laughs> to work on all these like huge variety of shows. I mean, okay. you know, there's like preschool, kids, adult stuff. There's hand drawn CG, uh, stop motion stuff being made. Uh, it's anime. Just like, yeah. Anime. Yeah. There's so much. And you know, barely any of it has been even announced yet. So um, it's just going to like, you know, especially next year and the couple years following, I think. Yeah, I feel like next gonna year take... people are going to start seeing the, the flowers yeah. bloom of everything that's being planted right now. And it yeah. is nuts. Yeah. Like, nuts. <laughs> There's so much coming, everybody. <laughs> and, and, and being at lunch over there was like, hey, look, Batman's here today. Yeah. Oh, hey, look, uh, Spider-Man is here. Like, <laughs> oh, wow, Galactus is stopping by. Yeah. Like, it's all, all your animation superheroes. Uh, you know, Wonder Woman is sitting with yeah. Catwoman over there. Like, it's crazy. I remember uh, um, at the Hollywood the Hollywood location where we were at when Henry Selleck and Jordan Peele showed up that one day and they're yeah. just kind of like walking around. Everyone's just like, oh my God, it's not, and like, you know, he's a stop motion God. <laughs> oh yeah. It's a, and, and obviously, you know, the, the amount of work that's happening right now, is kind of crazy. Uh, yeah. I would say we're in the goal, you know, people talk about the golden era of animation mm -hmm. uh, being in the you know, 30s and 40s. I think sure. The era is now because people who usually did not get an opportunity to tell their stories mm -hmm. are now getting that yeah. chance. Uh, you know, people of color, women, yes. uh, you look at, you look at the golden era and it's all white dudes. So yeah. to me, that's not the golden era. Uh, <laughs> but the, the golden era I believe is happening now. And the stories that we are getting to tell and the shows that we're getting to make, it's, it's just, it's never been more, immersive in, in the culture that we actually live in. Yeah. And for the first time, you know, I'm a, I'm a foreigner. Uh, so the, for the first time I'm being told, hey, if this works in the US, great. Mm -hmm. But yeah. the world is your audience. Yeah. Whereas before I was always told, this has to work in the US. <laughs> and if it works outside the US, bonus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, um, that was an amazing story. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Um, uh, I guess I, I haven't really been paying attention to the chat because I was, uh, but um, if we're getting some uh, some pitching questions, we can dive in if you'd like. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I have a whole, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about pitching. I think pitching is so important. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't teach this in school. It's kind of like stand-up. That's the, the thing yeah. that I can equate it to. Uh, all your favorite comedians, you guys, every single one of them, if you read or listen to them in podcasts, tell their stories, pretty much all of them say the same thing. They were awful in the <laughs> beginning. They all bombed. The ones that got good were the ones that had the courage to get back up again. Mm -hmm. Every time they bombed, they would, they would learn from it and get back up there. I think yeah. pitching is exactly like that. Mm -hmm. What's horrible about that is we are artists, right? So we are so used to creating our worlds, being alone when we make these things or with people we love and trust who love our work. And then we, for the first time, have to open ourselves and present, mm -hmm. you know, literally your dish. That, yeah. that, and a lot of times, especially when you're starting out, you are putting yourself out there. Yeah. And the moment it's rejected, it could crush you sure. and you'll never pitch again, <laughs> or you can learn from it yeah. and get better. Mm -hmm. Those are basically your only yeah. two choices. And a lot of the times when people reject your shows, and I didn't learn this uh, on my first try, I learned this from becoming friends with development executives and just asking them because they want to make good stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, they're the gatekeepers, but at the same time, they want a really good show so they can, help you get it made so they can say they helped make the thing. You know, people who help Steve Hillenberg and people who help Craig McCracken, you, like you can make a career out of shepherding a show become a hit. So that's, that's basically their job, right? They're, 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 they're positive enablers of something good to happen. Um, what I found early on was if I didn't invest myself emotionally into what I, what I was pitching, then it was just 
superficial. Yeah. And I found that that never connected. Yeah. The stuff that I found uh, execs, development execs uh, gravitated towards were always the personal yeah. and always the, the ones that hurt when they said no. So if it hurt when they said no, then there's something good in there. Yeah. And the reason they say no, a lot of times has nothing to do with you and it has nothing to do with whether your show is good or bad. It could be that they have something similar in development. It could be that something just like your thing didn't work three years ago and some moron said, no more shows about our monkeys. And, or <laughs> someone goes, I want shows about monkeys. So just as the, there's, there's crazy reasons why your show doesn't get developed, there's also crazy reasons as to why it does get developed. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, my, my first show at Disney, it was optioned, right? Uh, I'll tell you guys, it was $10,000 for a year to option the show. Uh, if you live in Los Angeles, you cannot make a living uh, for $10,000. Well, maybe you can if you, you live in your car and you, yeah. uh, <laughs> you eat garbage. Uh, maybe you could. So what the first lesson I learned in development was you can't make a living uh, doing development. You have to have a job uh, and do the development at night and on the yeah. sides. So very early on, the other thing that I learned was the, the best way to learn how to make a show is to work on a show. Yeah. And then when you start looking at other creators and you start looking at their histories, because you guys should ever study all your favorite showrunners mm -hmm. and look at their paths, right? Alex Hirsch, you know, Graham McCracken, Gendy, Lauren Faust, like look up everybody you love. They all work their way up. No one uh, was born and they gave them a show or no one graduated from school and they got, well, there are exceptions, right? <laughs> There's super geniuses out there who that, that stuff happens to them. It doesn't happen to us mortals, right? Mm -hmm. So working on other people's shows, I learned how to make a show, right? Because you're literally watching the sausage get made. Yeah. And you're going, well, I'm not going to do that. Oh, I'm definitely going to do that. Wow. That seemed like such a great idea here, but it's turning out to be a nightmare over <laughs> here. So all that you can't learn in a book. You can't learn yeah. in school. You learn on the job. Yeah. Then the other thing I learned was super talented people are always, in my opinion, the ones that know how to enable things to happen professionally. So they don't wait to be uh, inspired. They don't wait to be, uh, you know, inspiration hit. They treat it like a job. So that was another giant lesson I learned. Like you can have one great idea, but if you're a writer in animation, you better have one great idea every day. Yeah. And, and, and that's just, you just, these are muscles that you start developing. Uh, so when I pitch early and I got rejected, I was the guy who would ask the development people, Hey, so I know you're not into my thing. What would you change mm. about it? Or what in my pitch did you think worked? What didn't work? Yeah. Like, I know the stuff you didn't like cause you're telling me, but what did work? Is there anything in there that you liked or why, why are you passing on this? Just, you know, help me become a better pitcher and help me become a better creator. And all the people you pitch to, they hear pitches all the time. So they want to give you that advice. So, uh, you know, early on, the advice I got was you take too long to mm. get to the thing. Uh, sometimes you get too excited with the world and we are making shows about characters. Mm. And back then I thought in a world of, no, that does, yeah, that's yeah. not. In TV, especially, you know, when I started, it was the shows are about characters. And, I, and now that I'm older, I'm 45, I go, no, in television, shows are not about characters. Shows are about relationships. Mm -hmm. Right? Because you can make a show about a character and there's no one else, there's no relationships. Right. So that's what these shows are. Uh, so then as the more I learned, the more I started tailoring to uh, what I thought were good things and what I thought would make my stuff unique. Mm -hmm. The second lesson I learned was once you start pitching and your show gets optioned, your show will keep evolving, right? So at Disney, yeah. for example, they would option your show, $10,000. Uh, because I did not have enough writing experience, they paired me up with a writer. So that was a lesson. I was like, I need to get writing experience or no one's going to trust me 
to pay me to write. So I started trying really hard at writing samples. And eventually, I started getting writing jobs on preschool shows and then regular uh, you know, Saturday morning cartoons. Once you start writing professionally, then that little box in Hollywood gets a little bit bigger because they go, oh, you're an artist and a writer. And all my favorite uh, people in animation can write and draw, right? So think about your favorite directors, think about your favorite artists. Those two things are very powerful, both in movies and in TV. Writing is so important. It's where a lot of giant decisions are made. So I, if I could go back in time, I would, I would have started writing the moment I got into film school. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really encourage you guys, anybody who's in school right now, write, write as much as you can. I know for us artists, it's not a natural thing to want to uh, not draw, but the, the, the way I tricked myself was I said, if I write, I get to protect my designs and I get to protect my show and I get to make it clear what I want to make. And here's the crazy one. I'm going to learn to draw with words. Because uh. I see this stuff in my head. Well, I'm just going to describe it to someone who can't see. So that, that was a big, big, big learning thing for me. Uh, option your show. You start doing a script. I, I got paired up with writers I loved. Uh, you know, one of them went on to uh, write for Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Uh, another one became a, a story editor on Maya and Miguel, who then hired me. So you start developing relationships with different people. Uh, after you, you write a script, we, you know, we got approved. You move on to phase two, which was storyboards. So they greenlight a storyboard. Uh, I hired everybody I had met on Mucha Lucha, because at that point I was working on Mucha Lucha. And we started, uh, we did this crazy storyboard. I did a bunch of it, they did a bunch of it. Uh, <laughs> Because no one had made a show in Flash at Disney, uh, I said, I'm going to do my pilot in Flash. We did a thing called Pepe the Bull. Uh, you know, back then, they paid for a colored animatic. They wouldn't pay for it to be fully animated. But we were young and hungry. Uh, <laughs> and so he said, for the money you guys spent to color an animatic, we're going to animate the whole thing in Flash. And we did. We killed ourselves. We animated it. And they tested the show at Disney. It test back then they would let creators, I don't think they do that now, but back then they would let creators go to the test screening, mm. which was fascinating to yeah. see kids react to yeah. things. Uh, and they loved it. They loved Pepe the Bull. And then, uh, and then Disney said, hey, in order for your show to move forward, uh, we need your show to be about the sister. Uh, it can't be about a, a male protagonist. It can't be called Pepe the Bull. We want the show to be called Betty the Cow. And then they proceeded to pitch me, by the way, all those people are, are not there anymore, uh, <laughs> proceeded to pitch me uh, Betty, uh, Ugly Betty as a cartoon. Mm -hmm. uh, this is before the Ugly Betty TV show had come out in the US. But because I'm from Latin America, I'm like, isn't that Betty La Fea from Colombia, the soap opera? And they were like, Shh, no one needs to know. I was like, no, we're not gonna do that. Uh, so then they passed. Uh, and then at that point, it was one of those moments where I, I sat down with Sandra. I had, a, I had a steady job and I said, all right, we're going to do another pitch, but this time it's going to be even more personal. Let's, let's cut, you know, we've been, this is our heart. We've been slicing little, uh, little slices from it, yeah. right? Like a, like a, like a deli. Let's <laughs> fucking take out the whole thing and take out stuff from the center. Excuse. Let's go into the core, right? <laughs> Let's make this one hurt. Uh, so that's where Tigre came from, right? My dad and I, we base everything on our lives. Every, everything we've ever made is stuff that happened to us. So my dad, is, when I was a kid and I, uh, I, scratched, I scratched myself really bad, uh, I still have the, the scar, uh, and I was crying. I mean, I must have been five or six. Uh, he sat me down. This is in Mexico City. And he goes, why are you crying? And I'm like, because it hurt. And he goes, that's just another stripe. You're a tiger. You're a tiger now. And I was like, what? And he goes, Jorge, when you're born, you're born a puma. You have no stripes and no spots on you. As you grow up, things happen. Good things happen, but bad things happen. 
But every one of those things, that's a spot and that's a stripe. And you become oh. a cheetah and you become a then you become a tiger. And when you die, Jorge, this is, this is my dad telling me this at yeah. you know five years old. And when you die, Jorge, I don't want you to die a tiger. I want you to die a panther because you experienced everything. Wow. <laughs> right? <That's> beautiful. <laughs> El Tigre, he's a tiger. His grandfather, Puma Loco, mm. he's a Puma because he never learned anything. That's why he's a bad guy. And the dad is White Pantera. He's a white panther because everything he learned, he turned good. Right? The audience will never know any of this stuff. <laughs> but it's in there. Yeah. As a kid, I idolized two people in my life. I idolized my father and my grandfather. My grandfather was a general in the Mexican army, which is, which is, uh, you know, not the greatest of things. My father uh, is an architect, was an architect, and I idolized them. Uh, so I would go to both of their offices as a kid, and my dad would be. His office was all white, all natural light, all wooden tables, you know, before computers. And he would be drawing in these giant white pieces of paper houses. And I would say, Dad, uh, can you paint me? Can you draw me a dinosaur? Can you draw me a robot? And he would be drawing the house, put a piece of paper, draw me like a perfect dinosaur, or draw me a, a perfect uh, robot, hand it to me, and then just keep drawing. <laughs> and I thought, man, my dad has superpowers. Yeah. He can draw. I would go visit my gra my grandfather and his office was all the walls were red. It was dark. He had this like crazy red phone. And he was always yelling at people on it or like talking sweet, like sweet nothings to ladies that were definitely not my grandmother. Uh, and he would always disappear. He would disappear for weeks and no one knew where he was. Uh, and then he'd show up like nothing. So I was like, oh my God, my grandfather's a super villain. So my aunt would grab me by the cheeks, you know, chubby Mexican kid, and they would go, Jorjito, when you grow up, what are you going to be? Are you going to be like your dad? Are you going to be an artist? Or are you going to be like your grandpa? Are you going to go into the army? And that's where El Tigre came from, right? A kid who has a dad who's a superhero, a grandpa who's a supervillain, he's born into this family of greatness and he has to decide whether he's going to be good or evil wow. frida in the show which you know i'm wearing the shirt oh, off yeah. <laughs> is based on sandra so mm -hmm. frida in the cartoon her dad is the chief of police her mom's a judge her two daughters are police cadets and she hangs out with el tigre and is basically a bad influence on el tigre we always said frida was like jiminy cricket mm -hmm. uh backwards mm -hmm. uh, if manny wants to steal a car uh, Frida wants to light it on fire and, and, and explode it. So Sandra, her father was a surgeon. Her mom was a teacher. She has three sisters, all three studied medicine. She was the black sheep of the family because she wanted to be an artist. And I was the atomic satanic sheep of the family for wanting to uh, be with her. So her family hated me. Uh, and that's pretty much what happens in the show. Uh, that relationship is is the basis of the series it was like these two troublemaking kids one just happens to have superpowers uh learn that the road this is, this is my pitch these two kids learn that the road to hell is paved with good intentions so not everything you do that seems good is good and not everything you do that's bad is bad you can break the law for the right reasons or you could follow the law and do horrible things and use the law as the excuse. So we saw the idea that, you know, we come from Mexico. Morality is gray. This idea that everything is black and white, as the world has proven, is non-existent. So we might have been a little, a little ahead of our time back then. Uh, but they, you know, that was, that was the other lesson I learned when pitching. The story, and if you guys, any of you guys are writing this down, the story behind the story, I would say, is almost as important as what you're pitching. Where it came from, how you relate to it, what inspired it, that is a huge part of your show. So I always say, where did it come from, personally, internally? What is it? And how are you going to make it? 
right? Those are three. So every pitch I do, movies, TV shows, I break it into those three things. So, I try to mention in almost every episode of the stream here, you know, when you're creating something, put yourself into it. Put as much of yourself into it as you can. So yeah. that's what makes it as unique as it is and makes it stand out. Right. Like think about, think about, you know, for example, Brad Bird and the Incredibles. That's his struggle with being an artist on society. Uh, you know, Nightmare for Christmas with Henry Selig and Tim Burton, uh, an artist who's really good at spooky stuff, but wants to be a part of this other thing and then fucks it up and realizes, <laughs> no, 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 I'm pretty much, I'm good at my thing. Like mm -hmm. all these are very, once you meet those directors and once you meet these artists, these are very personal stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, uh, when I pitch Book of Life, I, I talk about how Day of the Dead is so important to me. I had a friend when I was a kid who passed away and I was super um, angry. My mom said I wasn't sad, but I was really angry. Um, and she, she sat me down and back then in Mexico City, people weren't celebrating Day of the Dead. They, they kind of looked down on it like, oh, that's for the, you know, the outer towns here in the city. We're modern. We don't do that stuff. This, again, this is Mexico City in the 80s. And she sat me down and she said, hey, Jorge, I'm going to tell you about Day of the Dead. So your friend who passed away, Mauricio, um, you know he's here, right? And I was like, what do you mean, mom? He's dead. And she said, no, we're talking about him. So as long as we talk about him, he's here. As long as you tell his stories and you, you know, laugh at the jokes you guys had between you. Yeah. You know, what was the favorite movies you guys saw together? What was the favorite food you ate together? As long as you remember him, mm -hmm. he's with you. Right? And what am I doing now? I'm literally talking about him. Yeah. So he's here. He's here. <laughs> as I got older, I, I felt a connection to the, to the holiday. And as people started passing away, you know, Mexico, we have a very different relationship to death than, than most other countries. I started sort of becoming really enamored with this idea of remembering uh, everyone who's passed. And so uh, by the time I got around to proposing to Sandra, I said, I'm going to do it on Day of the Dead because I want, I want him. Yeah, I want Mauricio to be by my side and I want all my family members and all my friends who passed away to be there. Uh, and so I proposed on Day of the Dead and I, you know, I got super drunk that night and I could swear he was there dancing with us. Uh, and she said, yes. And then a year later for the wedding, I said, well, now we have to get married on day of the dead so that everybody from both families uh, living in debt can be there. All this is in book of life, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and so that became a moment for me where I said, well, this movie I want to make is a gift to him. And if you guys watch the credits at the end in Spanish, I dedicated it to my grandfather who passed away. Sandra's dad who passed away, and then to Mauricio, my friend, when I was a kid. So the movie came from a very personal place. And then Book of Life is about an artist who can be good at other things, but he wants to be good at the thing he loves. And his whole family and his whole town uh, don't believe in him. That's every artist, right? So that's where that came from. And, and the idea that you have to die Right? The theme of Book of Life is you have to die or be willing to die for that which you believe in. So that, that's, that's, where, that's where Book of Life came from. Uh, once I pitched that, you know, the picture you guys heard, a lot of the executives in the room would cry. And I would cry. I mean, I, you know, I'm tearing up right now I'm talking about this. Oh. But this is the stuff that I think you can't fake. And this is the stuff that, especially for a movie, connects. Because when people Sorry. watch a TV show, <laughs> when people watch a TV show, they don't expect to cry on every episode. But a really good animated movie, hopefully, yeah. you will laugh and you will cry, right? If you can do both, something magical happens. Uh, so Guillermo del Toro told me an awesome, awesome piece of advice that I will pass on to you guys. He said when he made my favorite movie of his that most people have never seen called The Devil's Backbone, he killed himself to make that movie, right? He went bankrupt. It was, his health went bad. Very difficult movie to make in Spain. He thought his job as a director and as a filmmaker was to make the greatest movie he could make 
and that was it. When the movie was done, he was done. The movie bombed. No one saw it. And he said he learned that the effort you put into making your movie has to be the same effort you put into selling your movie. You can't fight the forces of marketing and distribution and all these things. You have to be a part of them to enable people to see your work, right? We make, we make things and if people don't see them, it's a, it's a, it's a travesty. Yeah. So when we were pitching Book of Life, he, cause we went to studios together, right? I would go into rooms, they would have the meeting thanks to Guillermo and then he would go, all right, Gordo, go. So I had to pitch in front of him multiple times to multiple studios and everybody said no. And I was like, wow, I have fucking Guillermo del Toro next to me and they're saying no. Mm. And he would always say, they said no for a good, the, the reason they said no is the reason we don't want to do it here. Some places would say, hey, we like it, but you know, we want a pop star to be the main character. Or, hey, we like it, but we, we don't like this wooden character thing. It's too weird. Uh, we like it, but can he not die? Like, we would get those type <laughs> of things in the room. And then immediately, Guillermo would be like, no, thank you for your time. Like, yeah. he was such a badass about that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, so eventually, when, when we pitched it to Fox and Fox went for it, it was one of those crazy moments where he said, okay, Jorge, now you're going to have to pitch this movie until the day it's done. And you're going to keep pitching it after. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, well, now you have to pitch it to every actor to convince them to do the movie, every composer, every executive, every head of marketing, head of distribution, head of consumer products, head of international. And he was right. I pitched, I probably pitched Book of Life, I don't know, 300 times before I got picked up by Fox. And I pitched it maybe a thousand times after. You just keep repitching your movie over and over yeah. and as you're making it. And before it's done, you're pitching it to movie distributors. You're pitching it to like, you know, uh, in Mexico, I had to pitch it to a company that makes coffins. So in 2004, you could buy a licensed coffin in Mexico with Book of Life characters uh, to bury your people. <laughs> I wanted to buy one as a joke, but then, uh, then my mom was like, no, no don't, don't do that. <laughs> I had no idea how, how long uh, you had written Book of Life, how, how long time ago. Oh yeah, uh, but before actually creating the film. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. Uh, you know, I, I. It's based on my student film from Cal Arts, so it's. Oh. It's. It's been. It's <laughs> been in my head for a, for a long, long time. Um, you know, I'll tell you my my next pitch. My next pitch story. Sure. Um, so when I got called in uh, by DreamWorks, they said, "Hey, we want to make a day of that movie. Um, do you know anybody who has a story?" And I was like, oh, "I have a story." So <laughs> I go in there and I pitch to uh, to the executives, and I keep moving my way up. Uh, and you know, the the executives were very kind. Uh, uh, eventually, I, I got to pitch to, uh, to Jeffrey Katzenberg, and for anybody who was there that day, it was kind of a legendary pitch uh, <laughs> on a Sunday morning at 6 a.m. at the Glendale studio. Mm. Uh, you know, Jeffrey's Jeffrey. Uh, so I show up, and, uh, and it was so funny. It was like, you know, he's at, at the height of, of Jeffrey's power at DreamWorks Animation. And I sit down and he sits down and all, you know, it was like, it was like pitching to the Pope and all the Cardinals yeah. are with him. Uh, and he's just surrounded by execs and I'm super nervous. This is, you know, this is a big deal pitching, pitching to Jeffrey. And I've, at this point I pitched like 20 other people before I got to him, right? This is the last, literally the last guy to pitch to, uh, the final boss. So uh, El Tigre hasn't come out. And the reason they called me in was, uh, you know, El Tigre, was starting to generate really good press um so he he goes all right i'm ready for my pitch and he opens his uh you know diet coke and they open his little cookies <laughs> and man i i pitched my heart out for 30 minutes 20 minutes into this pitch with jeffrey like people are laughing and people are reacting and he's looking at me like this <laughs> like zero emotion yeah Right. So I, I, I thrive. I, I feed off of the crowd. So I was like, fuck, I'm not getting anything from Jeffrey. All right. Time to go to level two. So I was like, I start like going louder and going crazier. And like, as I keep going, I see, I see his, his, his like perfect line mouth go. 
<laughs> Star Wars. Like, like, a, like a Marvel statue moving, right? Like, and I was like, ah, I got him. I got yeah. him. That's yeah. my end. So I keep going, and he starts laughing, and, and he starts reacting. And I get to the end, and I'm crying. Oh. And he wasn't crying, but, but I, I could swear his eyes look more shiny uh, at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so that the pitch finishes, and he goes, that was a wonderful pitch. Oh. So I'm like, Jeffrey, what did, what did you think of the story? That was a wonderful pitch. Thank you, Jorge. That was it. So he leaves the room and everybody was like, I think he smiled. Oh, I think he might have been into it. So everybody leaves. Uh, you know, the, the people on my side are going like, well, I don't know. We don't know what that was. You know, two days later, they, uh, they started talking and then they optioned the movie. But that was a... Uh, that was a crazy, crazy uh, Jeffrey moment for me. All at six uh, in the morning. All at six on that <laughs> Sunday, right? So oh, then uh, I'll tell you guys my, my, my pitch story for, uh, for Santa Jaguar at Google. So again, I'm, you know, this is post Book of Life. Things are going good. People are starting to come to me. Before it was, hey, direct, you know, Nachos the movie or, or <laughs> Chihuahua uh, versus Chihuahua the movie. Whatever the you know the shittiest Mexican thing you can think of, those are the movies that's getting offered. Uh, some studios are like, "Well, what do you want to make?" So I uh, I I ran my mouth at SeaGraph, I believe, uh, and I talked shit about um, virtual reality. Oh, that's another that's another lesson I learned. Uh, so at a, I'm on a on a panel somewhere, and someone asked me, "Are you PC or Mac?" And I basically said. Fuck Max. And the audience was like, what? And I'm like, Max are too expensive. And especially when you're an artist and you're starting out, that's when you have the least amount of money. And that's when a good Mac is the most expensive to you. So I am anti-Mac because of that. I use PCs because I can fucking build them out of junk. And <laughs> every two years I can change them. So fuck Max, right? So this... That's my son, Luca. Hey, Just Luca. Uh, I go, uh, I get a phone call. At, you know, again, crazy, crazy phone call. And they go, hey, hello, is this Jorge Gutierrez? I'm like, yeah, uh, this is Jorge. And I see in the, in the thing, it just said Microsoft on my, on my color ID. And they're like, hey, uh, did you say this? And they play me like a perfectly recorded clip of me saying, fuck Max. And I'm like, yeah, that was me. And, he, and they go, well, we'd like to hire you to do a Microsoft commercial for the Surface computers. <laughs> so Sandra and I got to do a, a Super Bowl commercial. Uh, and, and by the way, we made more money doing that commercial than we made making Book of Life. It was kind of crazy. Wow. So now, you know, any panel I go to, I'm like, fuck Ferrari. Fuck Tesla. <laughs> like, <I miss> it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, at this panel, That's I go, awesome. virtual reality, I don't buy it. I think it's bullshit. All this stuff about it's going to change cinema and it's going to change storytelling, blah, blah, blah. I don't buy it. Google heard me say that at that panel. Uh, they sat me down at CTN, by the way. So thanks to Tina. They sit me down and they go, hey, uh, you're a VR cynic. That's exactly who we want. Wow. Uh, we want you, who doesn't believe in virtual reality, to pitch us a virtual reality thing. So whatever you want to make, obviously we have to like it, but pitch us whatever you want to make. And creatively, just that just seemed like an incredible you know, challenge. So I studied VR and just enough to go, oh, this is like Mexican wrestling in that you put, you put the goggles on and you become someone else. That's what you do in Lucha Libre, right? You, become, you put a mask on and you become someone else. So I said, that's my in, Lucha Libre. And, you know, I've always wanted to be a luchador and it didn't happen. This is how <laughs> I get to be a luchador. Uh, so I, 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 I said, well, that's the surface. That's the, that's the theme. But what is the story about? Uh, so I, you know, again, took out my heart. There's multiple holes in there. I said, time to, you know, stab and take another yeah. thing out. Uh, and I said, I'm going to make it about my son and I'm going to make it about autism. And I'm going to make it about uh, basically what I'm going through right now. Uh, and I said, all right, I, it's going to hurt, but here it is. So I presented the story to them and I said, it, you know, my, my short is about a Mexican wrestler who's over the hill uh, and he's missing a leg. 
he lost his leg in, in, a, in a lucha match. And so he has a, a wooden plank for leg. He has a wife, a baby, and a little boy. And he can't wrestle anymore because wrestling is killing him. Uh, and so he's made a horrible choice. He's decided that he's going to die in the ring so that the insurance can go to his family. So he's literally going to sacrifice himself for his family. And this is when we find them in the story. His family's begging him not to do it. And he's saying, this, this is the best I can do for all of you because there's nothing else I can do. He goes into, uh, into the ring, uh, fights the guy that took his leg. The guy basically says, oh, well, I took your leg before. Today, I take all of it. I'm going to kill you. Kicks his ass. The mom, the baby, and the son watch. Just as the guy falls to the ground, uh, the bad guy is about to kill him. His little boy jumps into the ring and says, you want to kill my dad? You'll have to kill me. The bad guy says, I'll take both of you. I don't care. And he jumps to basically slam down and kill both of them. Time stops. You're watching all this, right? With your goggles. Time stops. At that moment, a voice comes out of you and you realize you're the ghost of the father of the wrestler. And you tell your son, what, what happened to you? And the wrestler's on the floor, missing a leg, seeing his son on top of him trying to stop death and death coming. And he goes, dad, I, I failed you. I, I, I failed your mask. I failed your name. I tried to protect my family and I couldn't. And the dad, the ghost of the dad, the ghost dad uh, goes, no, it's not over yet. You have my name, you have my blood and you have your family. So get up. So time goes back to normal. He manages to get out of the way and for the first time asks his son for help. And he goes, son, I can't do this without you. Will you help me? The son gets really excited and we don't know why. The son yells at the mom, mom, please, please, please. The mom says, okay, but don't, you know, please be careful. She takes out a mask from her purse, throws it into the ring. The little boy puts on the mask and the mask has a harness. And the little boy becomes the leg of the wrestler. So now the wrestler has his son and his leg. And now he's complete because he's with his family. And obviously he kicks ass. They beat the bad guy. They save the day. People throw money into the ring, which is what happens when you know, luchadors are retiring. They give him this giant trophy. And he says, I don't need a trophy. My real trophy is my family. And then you as the ghost, the father, get to fly back to luchador heaven and see that your family's okay. So how does that, what does that have to do with me and my, fa my father and my son? So when my son was born, I sat down with my dad, right? The same dad about, with the tiger and the jaguar and the puma. And he said, okay, Jorge, you, uh, you're gonna be a father. What is gonna change in you? And I said, well, dad, now, now a little cute baby, depends on me so i'm going to start making choices for them for my family it depends on me i'm the breadwinner i'm going to be more conservative with my with my choices and i'm not going to take as many risks in an industry and not as many risks as an artist because other people depend on me now and my dad looked at me and his eyes were were just so disappointed and he goes Jorge, did I raise a coward? And it, it, it was like a slap in the face. I, I obviously did not expect that to come out of his mouth. And I go, what do you mean, Dad? And he goes, any success that I've ever had and any success that you've ever had was because we took risks. Yeah. If you don't take risks, what kind of what kind of example will you be to your boy? What kind, of, what kind of example will you give him that that's how life works? And if things don't work out, you're gonna blame your family. If anything, now you take more risks. Now there's more at stake. And I was like, fuck that, like, you just, you just leveled me up. <laughs> so two and a half years go by 
Lucas diagnosed with autism. We were obviously, you know, shocked. It was, it was a something, and and I didn't know I had autism back then because I I was just diagnosed five years ago, uh, and so it was it, it shook our world. And I sat down with my dad. Yeah, I'm tearing up just thinking about this. Uh, I sat down with my dad, and he goes, "All right, you have a son with autism. What are you going to do now?" And I said, "Dad, I'm going to take even more risks." And he said, that's my son. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I knew so, having you on this pitch, that the topic of pitching would be uh, the best uh, choice. <laughs> I mean, you're all being pitched to right now. Just you explaining all of your projects and, and the, you know, the inspiration and the family connection behind them. So, yeah, thank you so much for, for this. Oh. We're not ending or anything, but no, uh, no, no. yeah, thank you. <laughs> but Nico, now imagine like I'm pitching what I just pitched to you and to all of you guys in a in a you know in a room at Google with like engineers <laughs> and and systems people and VR people and I was crying and they were crying and the head guy was like, How do we not make this? Yeah. <laughs> You were so born that, to pitch. <laughs> but again, I was terrible, you guys, terrible. And then the more you do it, the more it becomes natural. And, and by the way, the thing with pitching, honestly, is it's got to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it just sounds perfectly rehearsed, yeah. there's something not genuine about it. Yeah. And then if it's too raw and too crazy, then they just think you're insane. <laughs> So it's a it's a healthy balance, um, I, you know. I'll give you other other advice to you to everybody pitching from other countries because this happened to me early. Um, I would pitch certain shows where the person I was pitching to wasn't familiar with my culture at all, and so they didn't get a lot of the stuff that I thought made my thing great. And I, in my head, I was like, well, but I relate to white heroes. Like I related to Luke Skywalker and Indiana Jones and, you know, He-Man. Why can't they relate to my dude? Or why are they telling me like, well, I don't know what that is. So that doesn't make any sense to me. And so here's what I found. Because uh, it took a while for me and, and Sandra to figure out. So like a, like a fucking scientist, uh, we sat down and we started going, okay, where are our favorite books? Where are our favorite albums? Where are our favorite shows movies from other countries not american from other countries and obviously not mexican and what we found was you know i love city of god from brazil i love amelie my favorite movie is seven samurai i've never been to japan so my you know i love the wu-tang especially the early albums i'm a big hip-hop guy so i love i love the first albums what we learned was a lot of times the filmmakers and, and artists and musicians, their first piece, their breakout piece is about where they're from and it's about where they grew up and it's about events that happened to them and it's about the struggle to make it. And a lot of times it's not because they want to, it's because they have no choice. They can only afford to shoot in that part of their country or they can only afford to make work that has those stories what separated, you know, Amelie from all the French movies that were made that year or what separated City of God from all the Brazilian movies that were uh, made that year was that these movies traveled because there was something universal about them that people related to. Uh, you know, Seven Samurais about, you know, seven warriors who are the dying, clan, uh, dying class who defends these farmers and some of them are really ungrateful from thieves. That could be in Mexico in the revolution. That could be here in 2018. That could be anywhere. Like these are universal themes. Uh, sacrifice, love, mothers and daughters, siblings. All these things are incredibly universal. So what I now do is I try to go, my culture is the canvas, but I'm gonna paint a story that feels unique, but it's universal. And if you have to be uh, from Mexico to get the story, then I failed because I don't want to make stuff just for Mexicans. I want to make stories for the world. 
So that, that was a big, big, big lesson in everything I make. Like, I, obviously, I want to make things to celebrate where I'm from, but I don't want to make things only people like me from my country will understand. Because then you're in an echo chamber, yeah. right? So that, that's, hopefully that, that's something that is ho- uh, helpful to the oh, new yeah. generation. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, everything you've said so far is, extreme, is so helpful. <laughs> uh, let me um, jump into a... Cool. Yeah, if we, I'm sorry I've been rambling on, so oh, no, uh, let's do not all, questions. Not at all. <laughs> I, I'm happy to give the, you the floor here. Um, and, I, and, uh, and I love pitching. I learned to love yeah. to do it because I used to hate it. And now yeah. I, really, I really put myself into it. Uh, you know, Maya, I'm in the process now where like, mm-hmm. I pitch the show and now I'm pitching the show to yeah. international and consumer products. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> I had to pitch it to every actor. So it's just part, you know, it's part of our job. I can't wait for Maya, by the way. Uh, I'm, uh, well, when we were working in the studio uh, and I'm on Kid Cosmic, we were right next to Maya. So I would always see all the uh, concept art and the production artwork up on the walls. I'm just like, just like staring at everything. Just oh, looks beautiful. Nico, I gotta <laughs> tell you, you were always such a fresh, like positive energy. Uh, oh, anytime I walk by, you know, there's a lot of serious people in, in both productions. Oh, sure. And you yeah, were always yeah. like, hey, Jorge, what's up? Like, yeah, was, the world was ending and you and me were the happy guys. We were yeah. always like, yeah, dude, we're happy to be alive. Just making cartoons. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, from James Tito, or it says Tito.James, uh, what is your process for designing characters? Uh, so my process for designing characters, I am a, I, I was very lucky, and I got uh, to work with Maurice Noble, who's a, you know anybody who doesn't know what that That's is, great, yeah. his stuff yeah. is incredible. Uh, one of the things he taught me was to design from the inside out, mm-hmm. and he's not known for character design; he's known for you know environment and and sort of location designs. And when I asked him, like, well, what does that mean from the inside out? He said, "Who is your character before you start design?" You know, these are rules that he taught me. Don't find the character in the drawing. Find them in your head first. Who is he or who is she? Where are they in in their life journey? When are we finding them? Were they great and now they're not great? Are they on their way to be great? Are they great and they don't know they're great? Were they great and it was the worst thing that happened to them? Like, tell, figure out who they are. Their clothes should tell me one thing but the character should tell me something else. So are the clothes too big because he's trying to grow into them? Are the clothes too small because he's clinging to the past? Are the clothes mm-hmm. from this culture because he's trying to fit in, but he's not a part of it? Like every single thing in your character is telling me something. The shoes, the, sh- the you know, literally the colors. Why is every color there? Tell me the story behind each color. The audience will never know any of this, <laughs> but you know, yeah you need to know all those things right so you know if you look at manny from el tigre he's full of circles why so so that when the claws come out those triangles feel even more triangularly mm-hmm. like literally things like that right where you're going uh you know the the, the cliche one uh darth vader is basically a black triangle mm-hmm. how do you make a black triangle more black and more triangle you put white circles all around them stormtroopers Right, so use contrast in character design. All I always design the main characters first, and then design everybody around them. I never design the world first. The world should be designed, in my opinion, the world should be designed around the character. Uh, obviously, none of these are rules set in stone. These are just the rules that I follow. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other big one that I try to adhere to is. And some people hate this one, and it's very controversial amongst a lot of my character design friends. But I personally and Sandra have gotten into a habit of designing in really boring front view poses, like costume designers. Because if a character just standing there tells you who they are by the design, or they're funny just standing there, or they're evil just standing there, or they're heroic just standing there, when you pose them, it's just going to be more. Yeah. And when you move them, it's going to be even more. And when they talk, fuck, it's all going to be hitting at the same time. But if a character only looks good 
because he's posed cool, then the pose is cool. It's not the character. Okay. So no. that that's kind of a that's kind of a thing we do. Now, some people <laughs> take that as, oh, you're just lazy. You don't like to pose your characters. And they would be right, because posing <laughs> characters is super hard. Uh, and especially in CG, uh, I've been very lucky to work with people who can pose our characters a thousand times better than we can. Uh, I, I've, I feel like Sandra and I are designers, but we are not really you know, draftsmen when it comes down to posing and anatomy and construction. Uh, and we didn't have to be, because we work in, mostly in CG now. So we can we can design these characters to be puppets, and then uh, you know the computers will help us move them. Uh, I just did a two D thing that hasn't been announced, and I was reminded by how fucking hard two D is because there's no model. You gotta yeah. have, everything has to be drawn. All the detail, you know, we love detail, and all those details have to be animated. And if a design you start taking details away falls apart, then you gotta start over. Like yeah, you know, super tough. So two D. I love 2D, but God damn it, I'm so <laughs> spoiled with CG and super <laughs> complex characters. And, you know, if I add 666 skulls on Sibalba <laughs> in the Book of Life, I can't do that in 2D. Yeah. No one would animate 666 skulls <laughs> on a character. They just wouldn't. <laughs> they'd, they'd murder me first. <laughs> All right. Um, Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. <laughs> this next one I'm also curious about. Um, does posting character designs or any or anything really to social media help or hurt you while while you're pitching the studios? Well, I think if if you post if you pitch the characters that you're pitching, uh, honestly, I don't think it matters anymore. Uh, I found that if you have an online comic or you you know you have a character that you sort of present all the time in social media. By the time you pitch, if you have a big enough following, the studio goes, hey, look, your thing's already popular. We want to make your thing. So like Skatey, you know, Katie Rice yeah. uh, had her, her uh, what was it, uh, Camp We Don't Want You, Katie mm -hmm. Rice and, and Adam, the, her husband, they had established their characters. So by the time Nickelodeon approached them, they got to keep their publishing rights. So as soon as their pilot didn't go through a series, which was a fucking crime, uh, they were able to keep their characters. So part of me thinks it's almost better to create an online presence of your characters before you pitch, just so mm -hmm. that they're protected. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Um, uh, th this one I can help. <laughs> I'm from Eric. If you pitch to a studio and then the person you pitch to gets fired, what then? You try to find another in. And I, I, I know people that's happened to. Well, if you pitch to someone and they didn't option your thing and they get fired, then you pitch again. Yeah. If you pitch to someone, they you option your over. thing, and then they got fired, Yeah. it's almost like they're taking you down with them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be tough. So you should pitch something else to them wherever they go. That's kind of what of, happened to us. Yeah, a lot of times you'll get way in, and they'll yep, like the executives, and they'll be like, "Well, I didn't, I didn't greenlight this, so you know, pull the plug." And that has nothing to do with you. Yeah, this is just the storm. This is the weather. Some mm -hmm. days it rains, some days it's sunshine. Yeah, but you cannot, you cannot get angry. You can't, you know, you can't be like, "God, why, why is it raining?" <laughs> like the rain doesn't care. <laughs> Um, Veronica is asking with pitches, would you recommend getting an agent uh, to help you get into the room to pitch if you're still trying to get in? Uh, with a, trying to get into the room. All right. So this, this is a, so I, I mean, the, the way it happened for me was different. The, so I, I made a student short, it won a student Emmy and that basically got me a manager. And then the manager just represented me and got me in the room to pitch. Uh, agents wouldn't represent me. Uh, until I made Book of Life. Uh, after wow. I made Book of Life, uh, all the you know agencies wanted to rep me. And so now I'm with William Morris Endeavor and my manager. So I have an agent and a manager. Um, when you're starting out and you want to pitch your thing, I personally think you should make a short <laughs> and put it online that's so good mm -hmm. that when people go, who are you? Click, wow, yeah. let's get him in the room. Yeah. 
Because yeah. if you just have a good idea, that's not enough. Mm-hmm. If you just have a good idea and a kick-ass pitch Bible, kind of not enough yet. Yeah, I mean, that's, sort, that of my, that's right? sort of my plan with Ollie and Scoops is that yep. I'm just making episodes and then you are I'll making stuff. You're a creator with <laughs> or without them. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is if you work on a show and the show is successful, mm-hmm. you will get to ride that wave. Yeah. So anybody who's working on a hit show, everybody's going, wow, you know how to make a hit show because mm-hmm. you are literally working on one. Ah, oh, man, you work on a shitty show. Well, at least you know how to make a show. Uh, yeah. So uh, I would say for kids who are starting out, especially graduating from school or just starting in their careers, make a thing. If you tell people you're funny and you can make cartoons, show them a mm-hmm. cartoon that proves it. Yeah, you know, just saying it is not enough, especially now. It, it helps so much to have a finished thing and be like, this is what I do. If you like it, you know, we'll make more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like someone telling you, like, I'm really funny. It's like, yeah. Mm, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> show me. Um, from Eric, uh, you played, do you play D&D? What was your favorite character you've ever made? <laughs> Uh, so I do play D and D. I started playing D and D for Maya and the three, uh, and it changed me. It definitely changed how I approach storytelling. Uh, it really informed me. Honestly, I didn't know. I had no idea how important uh, it is in Hollywood, especially now amongst the the executive producers and the writers. I really encourage all of you guys, especially COVID era, mm. play D and D. Try to play once a once a week, or you know, we play every two weeks. Uh, it's it's fascinating to approach stories like this because these are literally character driven choices in an overall story. Yeah, and I think the dungeon master becomes the storyteller. Uh-huh. So I, I'm I'm loving it. Um, cool. And I and I really encourage anybody who's into writing, world building, uh, play D and D. I mean, if you like Adventure Time, that's basically D and D. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, from Parker, what are common things network execs look for when it comes to pitching your project in front of them? Do you think the business execs have knowledge with telling a story using the mediums of art? Talk about using different styles of art to tell a specific story. I guess so. Um, I think those are two, two different questions. Yeah. One, I would say, if you make your pitch about the art, you're screwed because the show looking good is a given. Right. So that cannot be the strength yeah. of the show. Uh, if you go in there referencing, you know, obscure anime and, and you know, Soviet era, 1972 films. And like, if you go in super nerdy with, uh, with your knowledge of the animation, that's not what gets shows. <laughs> uh, so that, you know, save that for, for when you're recruiting, save that for when you're making the show. But when you're pitching the show, it's about the, what is the show about? What are the characters? What are the conflicts? Here's what the pilot could be. Here's what happens. You know, the way series work is SpongeBob doesn't change from episode to episode. The things that happen to SpongeBob change, mm-hmm. right? But he's the same guy at the end of the episode. Yeah. Serialized cartoons, sure, they can change a little, but it's a season arc or it's yeah. a two season arc or, you know, what we're doing, it's a limited series. Mm-hmm. So that arc is over a certain amount of characters. In a movie, those characters better change. Yeah. Right? You know, <laughs> even though Paddington 2 is a masterpiece and I adore Paddington 2, I think if I pitched a movie and I went, the main character doesn't change, he changes the world. <laughs> uh, I don't think any executive in feature animation would do it. Yeah. Uh, it's, they're so used to the character, the traditional Hollywood animation character arc. Uh, but yeah, Paddington 2 for anybody, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that's a Frank Capra character. The, those yeah. Frank Capra characters do not change. They change <laughs> the world around them. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's one thing. So I would say the art is important, but the show looking amazing is a given. Yeah. They're going to expect if, the show to look good. Yeah. That's what they want. <laughs> um, uh, from, uh, how do you, uh, from Perry, how do you find a studio or choose what studio to pitch to? Uh, you know, the, the way to do it, the way I learned it was who's making the stuff that I like yeah. and then who is making the type of things where I think my think could live in. 
So we, I remember at the time going like, well, this show seems like a Cartoon Network show. We should pitch a Cartoon Network. Wow, Tigre is such a Nickelodeon idea. We should pitch yeah. Like you, you know, and if, and if you guys aren't watching these channels or these, these sort of studios and you show, you know, you show up in Nickelodeon and you're like, my show is about an underwater, blah, blah. Like you lost them at underwater. <laughs> so being unaware of what they're making and being unaware of what's their bread and butter you know, if you show up to uh, Cartoon Network and you're like, my show is about four little superhero girls, uh, <laughs> not going to happen, right? Yeah. Too close to Powerpuff. So you got to do your research. You got to figure that out. Uh, once you, you get a pitch, I, Mr. Robot, everybody, I basically Google people and I find out you know, LinkedIn, what, Facebook, fuck, anything. I just want to know, do we have friends in common? Where did they work? What have they worked on? Where are they in their careers? Like, because that's what they're doing about you. They're looking you up. Yeah. Uh, so if you were on Twitter saying, I fucking hate Disney Channel, blah, 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 <laughs> like they know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to be really smart about these things and you got to be very, very careful with your social media footprint because, uh, uh, you know, if I ever wrote down the fucking bullshit that came out of my mouth when i was in college uh <laughs> on twitter or tumblr i i would i would be in big trouble so i uh i was an idiot so don't you know learn from us older dudes do not say crazy things on social media because the moment you start looking for a job whatever the worst thing you said online or the trash you talked about shows or movies it will come back to you <laughs> Um, oh, from anonymous, how would you how would you explain how to do a pitch in steps? Um, oh, all right. So I, yeah. I mean, I break it down uh, whenever I pitch. I, I these days I basically pitch with PowerPoint or Google Slides. I have my pitches uh, pretty much ready, and I break them up into uh, you know if it's a series, I and a movie, I kind of break them up into the same chunks. I go. First chunk is, here's what my thing, like, here's where it came from. And I, you know, a picture of me as a kid or a picture of me and my son or a picture of me and my wife, like, here's the personal. Here's what inspired the story. And I go through all that. Then I go, here's what the show is. So by pitching the personal story, I basically pre-pitch the show, mm -hmm. right? When I told you guys about where El Tigre came from, I was basically pitching you El Tigre. Yeah. <laughs> then I pitch the show and I'm basically re-pitching. But now in the cartoon and in the fantasy universe and in the uh, here's what you heard, here's how we're going to do, take that and leave out all the boring parts and make it exciting and exaggerate and make it fun and funny and crazy. And here's what it's going to look like. And then three, here's how we're going to make it. They're going to be 22 minute episodes. They're going to be 11 minute episodes. Uh, we're going to do it in flash. We're going to do it in you know, stop motion. We're going to do it in CG. We're going to use, uh, you know, the studio they did, uh, Kung Fu Panda, if it's a CG show or Troll Hunters, we're going to use CG, CG. Like you got to do your research as to who are the studios that are making the things behind the scenes. Uh, so I like on the production side, I like to show up and say, here's where it came from. Here's what my thing is, and then here's how I'm going to make it. And then for a studio like Netflix, Netflix is really good when you know what you want to make and you know how to make it. Uh, a more traditional studio, right, the Nickelodeons and the Disneys, uh, Cartoon Networks, there is a factory system of how they make their shows. So when you pitch a show, you kind of don't have to worry about a lot of that stuff because they go, all right, you're the creator. We're going to pair you up with a season, blah, blah, blah. We're going to put you here. You're going to pick this, but we're going to give you this. Your line producer is going to come from here. And they kind of build the show based on the format of how they made shows before. Mm -hmm. And the thing, the plugging in is just different talent. A place like Netflix or you know Amazon, Apple, they're basically going, we're indie. You build it. Yeah, you tell us how you want to do it. If you screw this up, man, you really, you really <laughs> screwed it up. But if you succeed, guess what? We're going to let you make more. Yeah. 
So it's, it's a different world. But if you're just starting out, uh, I would say just get out there and start pitching. Um, make shorts, and, and, and I mean shorts, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, a minute max, just so they can go viral and so you can get your stuff out there. Yeah. Um, from Carrie, how much practicing, how much pitch practicing do you do uh, with your wife? Is she a tough critic? Yeah, she's horribly brutal. And, and honestly, you guys need, I mean, tough love, right? Uh, you need someone to be very honest with you. Uh, and when I pitch her idea, she is the one that gets to decide uh, on a lot of things. But if you are surrounded by people who love you, who just tell you everything you're doing is great, yeah, fuck. Yeah. You need honest helpful. friends. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the way these things work is you got to build the network. You can't just call your friends to help you. You got to also call them to offer help on their things. Well, my mom so, says it's the best cartoon she's ever heard of. Yeah, you can't. That doesn't help. And what do you mean you don't like it? My dad said it was a mate. Like, no, yeah. dude. my girlfriend loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And you, and you usually, you, you pitch with uh, Sandra too, right? Uh, when we pitched, uh, El Tigre was the last thing we pitched together. Okay. Um, she, she kind of, uh, you know, she kind of retired from that stuff. Mm -hmm. So now Sandra works on all, all, anything I make. She designs, she reads all the stuff, you know, she does voices. So she's very, very much involved. Uh, but the pitching wasn't something she enjoyed. Mm -hmm. uh, and definitely the... Um, the life consumption of making your own cartoon uh, was not her thing. Uh, after El Tigre ended, uh, you know, to this day, she, she, she will never forgive Nickelodeon for, for canceling El Tigre. Uh, for me, and I, again, it might be the autism, but for me, when we got canceled, I was like, great. Now I get to make new things. And thank you for spending $20 million on, on El Tigre <laughs> and, and letting us hire all our friends and, and and fuck, we won fuck, seven Emmys. Like, thank yeah. you. And thanks to a theater getting canceled, I got to make Book of Life. Mm -hmm. So every time something bad's happened, it's allowed for something better to happen right after. Yeah. And you know, I look back at my career and I go, hey, if my little internet cartoon cartoon hadn't had kept going, I would have never made El Tigre. And if I hadn't made El Tigre. Uh, and Guillermo del Toro would have never seen it. And if El Tigre hadn't been canceled, uh, I would have kept going on El Tigre, and then Coco would have come out, and I never would have made Book of Life. Yeah. So thanks to El Tigre getting canceled, I got to make Book of Life. And then thanks to Book of Life doing the you know doing what it did because it wasn't it wasn't a giant box office hit, but it blew up on home video. Yeah. And it kind of allowed, it basically allowed me to not live with the pressure of making another billion dollar box office movie. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of kept me hungry yeah, <laughs> in, a, in a weird way. So I always say like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm chubby and uh, I'm out of shape, <laughs> but fuck, I have a six pack in my heart. Yeah, I, I'm in the best <laughs> shape I've ever been. Oh, that's great. <laughs> your brain is a six pack. Yeah, your brain and heart are a six pack. <laughs> Um, uh, from Paul, uh, how do you find ways to contact studios to pitch to if you have not worked there previously? It's a tough one. It's a, it's, so if you haven't worked in animation and you just want to pitch, that's going to be almost impossible. Yeah. Because if you have, if you work in animation, you have friends who work in other studios, then they can direct you to the pitching people and then they're going to go, hey, what does your friend work on? Well, my friend works on this show. All right, he can come in to pitch. Yeah. But just an outsider off the street coming they in. They don't work, yeah. It what do they work on? Work oh, they haven't like worked that. yet. Yeah. It's, uh, it's super, super hard. It's a, uh, animation's pretty small and it's pretty open-minded, but it can't just be an outsider. It's gotta be mm -hmm. someone who uh, is already in or getting in or is about to get in or has won awards mm -hmm. or has made a short that's gone viral. Like, you got to come in with something. Yeah. Um, I mean, I waited to pitch to Nickelodeon until I worked at Nickelodeon first on someone else's thing. Right. You know? Right. I mean, honestly, yeah. that's, uh, that's just the way it is. Yeah. Uh, this is interesting. 
I don't think you've pitched since COVID happened, but uh, how would you well, say I pitch, pitching? I pitch, oh, have you? Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So then the question is, what's pitching like during COVID times from a distance? Uh, pitching, pitching in COVID has been honestly awesome because <laughs> – you control the screen. Basically, so when I pitch, I pitch uh, e using uh, Google Slides on Google Meetings because that's what they use at Netflix. Uh, so I get to control. I get to control the screen. I get to show them the art. They don't have to look at me. They basically have to look at the stuff I'm showing. And I time it as I'm pitching, just like people, you know, pitching storyboards. Uh, I, I can, I can, you know, one of the big problems when you pitch to a room is people start looking at their phones and that throws mm -hmm. you off. Or people start looking away, or, mm -hmm. or you know, if you have everything pinned on the wall, they always look ahead. Mm -hmm. They can't help themselves. So I love that I get to control all that, and I I love that I don't have to see their faces if they're not looking at the stuff I'm presenting. Yeah. So I, it's been great for me. Uh, I pitched, you know, hasn't been announced, but I pitched. Uh, uh, I pitched. Let's just say I pitched a movie uh, to Netflix that I'm currently writing, uh, and it was great, and I love it. I COVID for me. Obviously, it's awful, and a lot of people have died. But as an artist in animation, it has been a magical time. Yeah. I have never felt more inspired. I have never felt more, uh, honestly, m more responsible for the stuff we're making. Uh, there's going to be a whole generation of kids that have survived COVID and have lived through this uh, pandemic. and we need to keep making stuff to inspire them and we need to keep making stuff to uh, illuminate them that the world uh, is a better place. Uh, and honestly, I, I, I have never felt more strength in me to make things that matter and make things that showcase that being from a different place is good and normal. And I, I, I'm, I'm loving this time. I get to be with my family more. I get to see my son more. Um, I talk to family members in Mexico City that, that I never had, <laughs> I, I never had that much contact, and now with COVID, we talk once a week. Cool. Uh, so <laughs> it's been it's been uh, COVID's been really re really lit a fire in a good yeah. way. Uh, I know at some point I might crash uh, from the from all this adrenaline, but <laughs> man, this wave this wave we're getting, you guys, in animation, yeah, we gotta surf it. It's coming it's up. magical. <laughs> Uh, I love that you're in the middle of all this work on Maya and you're still pitching. That's great. <laughs> I mean, I, I, that's, that's uh, you know, maybe it's because I'm from Mexico and, and I, you can't rest on your laurels. I, I always felt I need to have a thing after the thing. I'm making sure. all the time. Yeah. And I, I think it's healthy. Mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of artists only work on one thing at a time. But I find that for me, I really thrive when I'm working on multiple things yeah. so that I don't hyper-focus too much on a thing. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> okay. Uh, from Lauren, uh, what do you always make sure to include in your pitch Bibles? Man. I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't had a pitch Bible since El Tigre. Uh, <laughs> And by the way, it was uh, back then, and I did it. I did it for Karma Gets Expelled, and I did it for uh, uh, Super Macho Fighter at Nickelodeon. Once they like the idea, they pay for a Bible. Okay. They go, we'll pay you to write a Bible, and we'll give you money to design stuff for the Bible. So then they're involved in the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I pitched Carmen, I basically had just character designs and me talking. Yeah. When I pitched Super Macho Fighter, same thing. I had character designs and just me talking. Uh, but this is after El Tigre. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, uh, when I pitched Pepe the Bull, when I pitched El Tigre, those were like maybe 10 page Bibles. Mm -hmm. Like I learned a long time ago, keep your Bible really short. Yeah. Um, it's not like they're not, they haven't made up their mind by page nine and they're yeah. like, well, these other 32 pages will really yes, convince yeah. me. <laughs> they kind of made up their mind on the first page, by the way. Uh, so I would do, you know, title page of whatever the show was with the, inventive fun uh visual of the main characters never the world to me i was always it was always about the characters go inside and i would say here's what the show's about here's who the main character is and here are all the relationships with all the other secondary characters uh you know antagonists blah 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 all that stuff and then here are six or nine sample episodes 
as it. And the rest was you just talking pretty much. And the rest was me talking. Yeah. Um, and then I figured if you don't like that, I mean, I didn't waste too much time and yeah. I didn't waste too much of their time. Yeah. So keep it short. I mean, pitches are usually what, 20, 30 minutes? Usually you get 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh, but now that I'm friends with a lot of development people, uh, they say that they pretty much know minute one if yeah. they want to do it or not. Yeah. And they're just being pleasant with you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did, you, did you get any input on who you were teamed up with? Uh, yes. So oh. when when I first started out, uh, they said, we're going to pair you up with someone with a lot of experience because you have none. And they were right. So I got to pick, I, I read a ton of samples. Oh, this is, made, this is early on. This is early yeah, this is early on, on at Disney. Uh, and I, I got to pick the writers that I liked and then I heard their picks and thankfully we coincided, but they could have trumped my decision. Mm -hmm. If I would have gone in there and gone, hey, I want to hire my buddy uh, to write it. And they go, well, you've never done anything. Your buddy's never done anything. No. So that was a big, a big thing. The less experience you have, the more they're going to pair you up with seasoned people. Uh, even El Tigre, right? When we, uh, when we did the pilot, uh, they didn't let me direct it. Uh, I, I was very lucky and I got to hire Dave Thomas to direct it, who is a very seasoned, incredible director. Yeah. I learned a ton from him. He's but my director right me, now. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're working with, with, with Dave. He's just incredible. Um, you don't have enough experience. Uh, and I said, well, yeah, you're right. And I want to learn. It's my first show. Yeah, I want to learn <laughs> from a badass director. And, I did. and then on Book of Life, uh, they wanted to pair me up. You know, again, Book of Life is later in my career. They wanted to pair me up with a very seasoned feature animation writer. And honestly, all the feature animation scripts I read were garbage to me. I did not like any of them. Uh, and so I said, okay, I'll make a deal with you guys. I'm going to hire my head writer from my seven Emmy winning TV show, <laughs> Doug Langdale, to co-write the script with me. We're going to write the script together for the Writers Guild minimum. And if you hate it, fire us. Because he's <laughs> never written an animated feature, and I've never written an animated feature. But we are willing to bet on ourselves. And I remember uh, Real Effects and Fox were like, well... Yeah, we're gonna have to fire you guys at some point. Like they just zero belief. Uh, <laughs> we turned in that that uh, that script, and uh, and I remember it was like, "Ton of a bitch, this is good." <laughs> and, and they were really happy because it was really cheap. <laughs> but again, you 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 uh, you bet on yourself. Cool. Um, I was just reading ahead for this question. At a pitch. Uh, how much do you say about your personal connection to the story? How much do you want to tell? And how fast should you get to that part? Oh, I, I, those are the first five minutes of okay. my, any pitch I do. I spend pretty much the first five minutes on that. I must maybe spend 10 minutes of what the, on what the thing is about mm -hmm. and maybe two minutes on how we're going to make it. Like, if they give me half an hour, I'm done in less than 20. Okay. Cool. They might have asked that before your uh, step by step <laughs> yeah. pitching. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then for anybody who wants to know got a Writers Guild rates, go to the Writers Guild website. It's all in there. It's like okay. the Animation Guild, all the rates are in there. Um, how, how, to, how, how can I find a mentor and become a showrunner? Sorry. How to find a mentor and to become a showrunner if you are uh, from a country outside, if you're from outside the United States, but you want to work with people you look up to? Um, well, I mean, again, it doesn't, because of COVID, it doesn't matter where you are anymore. Sure. Yeah. So as long as you're making, you know, make an incredible short, make mm -hmm. an incredible thing that. You have, yeah, there's YouTube that's instantly. Yeah the entire world can see. Yeah, you know? and people go like, but I don't know how to do that. Guess what? None of us did. We, <laughs> yeah. We all learn. Yeah. The, you know, I always say, you want to learn how to direct? You direct. Yeah, just make, make you stuff. You want to learn how to make cartoons? Make a cartoon. Yeah. Just make stuff. And the more you make, the better you'll get. And yep. 
put it all online. Uh, do you copyright your stuff before pitching? I just read the, the thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, I used to, but once you have an agent and a manager, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but you can, you can um, submit it to the Writers Guild for 20 bucks uh, before you pitch, just so that it's, it's there. Uh, but copywriting things before you pitch them is really expensive. So mm -hmm. might not be worth it. Here's a good one. Is there, what's the difference between pitching a TV show versus pitching a movie? Uh, so pitching a TV show, you're basically, well, you know, back in the day, you were basically pitching something that would never end. Okay. Right. You were basically saying this can go on for a million seasons. <laughs> uh, pitching a movie, you're telling them the ending. This uh, is what the movie is. This is what happens. And this is how it ends. So it's, ve it's very different uh, pitches and they're very different executives. You would never pitch to TV people a movie and you never pitch movie people a TV show. show. And Netflix, there's that weird in between, mm -hmm. but you're still pitching to series people. So for example, you know, the, the execs that, I, that I'm working with are amazing. Uh, Megan Casey worked on Korra and, and you know, Ninja Turtles and all these shows and Nickelodeon. So she was used to uh, serialized. So she kind of understood where we were going. Um, on the movie side, I'm pitching to movie executives. So I'm tailoring my pitches to movies. And uh, I was very lucky and I got to sit in on a lot of pitches at Real Effects and I got to sit in on a lot of pitches at Warner Brothers when I was over there. And so I got to see directors and writers pitch movies. And man, some people are just amazing, amazing at pitching. Um, I got to see Guillermo del Toro pitch Book of Life uh, oh, wow. once and it was one of those things where you just go that guy has been doing this so long and he's so good at it he basically told my story better than i told you know than i told it and he made me cry with my story <laughs> like it was incredible incredible uh, just, just from this stream alone you're i, I think you're a master pitch pitchman because I mean, I, 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 when you're when you were telling the uh, Del Toro story, I see people in the chat going like, "I'm on the edge of my seat," like that right there. You're that's a great pitch that you're you know telling a great story. And then uh, the one about your family, I saw people in the chat going like, "Wow, I'm tearing up." It's like, yeah, it's you know, all these are. <laughs> all well, these I, are you know, I will I will say this, you guys. Um, when people, you know, I, some of you might not, uh, I don't know how old a lot of people you are, but there are stories in your life that you're going to tell over and over, mm -hmm. right? Your first fight or the first, you know, how you met the guy you love or the girl you love. Like there are certain stories, first time you got your heart broken, that you are going to tell forever. Mm -hmm. And every time you tell that story, you are going to cut all the boring parts out and you're going to exaggerate or emphasize all the things that matter and you have been telling that story so long that you start to to see people's reactions mm -hmm. and that is pitching right you're basically uh one of the things i like to believe when i pitch is i seen the movie in my head or i've seen the tv show in my head and i'm going into a room with all my friends and i'm telling them about it so I'm going, oh my God, you got to see this show. What, why? What's this show about? Oh, well, the show's about this. And then this happens. And then this character does this. And you're not going to believe it. Then this happens. And that's just the first <laughs> episode. Oh my God, I saw this movie. Oh, what is it about? Oh my God, it was about this. And then this happened. And because of that, this happened. And when all was lost, this happened. <laughs> In the end, this happened. You're basically pitching a show at a movie. That's how we tell each other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when pitching, what are the networks exactly look? What are the networks exactly looking for in your pitches? Genre, character, story. What makes pitching a cartoon grabbing to the executives? I, I mean, again, I'm going to say, I think it's definitely characters and character relationships. Bonus point, the world. Very rarely does a show get picked up because of the world, 
right? Like I saw that Avatar pitch Bible. It's incredible. Uh, the Last Airbender. And that's the only Bible I've seen where they really laid out the mythology of the world and then they introduce Aang. But that's the only exception I've ever seen to that rule. And that was a serialized show. So that that's an anomaly or was an anomaly. I think things are different now. Um, I wish more creators would post their Bibles. But yeah, it's basically uh, what's the nugget? What's your show about? Yeah. Right? Like what's... What's uh? How do you tell people? You know, don't, don't don't narrow it down to two sentences. But what is the nugget of the idea? Oh, El Tigre. It's about a kid whose dad's a superhero, whose uh, grandpa's a supervillain, and he's caught in the middle, and he has to decide where he's going to be. That's it. There you go. <laughs> you give me hope, Jorge. I can't thank you Nico, enough. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, from Hannah, when you get critiqued during a pitch, how do you determine what advice will help your project versus the advice that is trying to sh reshape your project? Well, I, I, a long time ago, I used to take notes personally, right? Like there are personal attacks on my family and there are personal attacks on me and blah, 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 blah. That, that's not true. The, the reason people give notes is to make things clear or they're confused and they're trying to help you <laughs> to make your thing more producible. So, hey, maybe take out the R-rated parts or the uh, parts that might be deemed unsensitive to people of certain race or certain gender. And three, when they can tell, this is the, these are the bad notes, when they can tell there's something off but they don't know how to say it, mm -hmm. so they'll just give a note. So yeah, as yeah. an artist and as a storyteller, when you hear these things, kind of on you to decipher where they came from and what they mean and if you pitch your show three times and all three times you got the same notes then there's something there yeah if you know we do that on our show or in our movies where like i show it the whole crew and i ask the whole crew to give me notes on everything so my skin i'm a fucking rhino i feel nothing <laughs> i'm so you like it, i ask harsh notes from people i admire and people i love because I want to get better. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I when I get a note from an executive or when I get a note from a studio, I know it sounds like a cliche, but there's a power to this. If you can take every note and use that as an opportunity to make your thing better, then you win every time. The next question from Colin, I hope you listen to that because that's pretty much the answer to your question, which is, for someone who in the process of pitching, how do you find the motivation to keep pushing onward despite getting the door closed in your face? Uh, so the big motivation is you are asking a studio to spend about $20 million on something that came out of your head. Yeah. Uh, nowhere else does that happen. <laughs> right? A lawyer doesn't go into a law firm and they're like, can I have $20 million, please? <laughs> But we do that in cartoons and we do that uh, in animation. And if you're making a movie, you're going, hey, can I have $100 million to make my thing? <laughs> so that's what keeps me motivated. That I, if I'm smart, I get to take a studio's uh, money and make something that I love and get to hire all my friends and get to make hopefully something soulful that leaves our medium better than we found it and hopefully makes money for the people who invested in it so that more people let me do more stuff. So that's my motivation. Great. How quickly should you get, wait, we answer that, sorry. Okay, uh, so you said Guillermo gave you 30 minutes to pitch. Do you always get a set time limit? Usually, you yeah. usually get a set time limit, and especially super important people. Uh, getting an hour is super hard. So 30 mm -hmm. minutes is kind of standard. Yeah. And then if they really love it, they can go over. Mm -hmm. But if they're not into it, you are getting kicked out 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> this is, you know, 30 minutes of their extremely busy day. And they get, you know, I have development executive friends who say, you know, I had 10 pitches in one day. Yeah. 
So for us, it's tiring to do two or three in a day. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how much I've done, three. Nico, you were telling me you did two in a day. Yeah. Uh, but they take 10. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you find or know your own voice? Wow, that's a tough one. Uh, I think you're, you know, uh, I, to me, I equate voice to style. Um, you don't find your style, your style, and this sounds, you know, wishy-washy, but it's true. You don't find your style, your style finds you. And it finds you working. So the more you do, the more your style happens. Mm -hmm. And your style will be a mix of all the things you love, all your influences, but it's also all the things you don't love mm -hmm. are in your style. So if you hate drawing this, that's not in your style anymore. If you don't like this or you find this too hard to do or this reminds you of this, then you take that out. So, you know, Mike Mignola uh, famously has said, I didn't like drawing certain things. And that's why Hellboy comes out of the dark. So I didn't have to draw backgrounds. Mm. And I don't like to draw horses. So guess what? I'm not writing any stories with horses. In <laughs> so your strength also becomes the things you don't want to do. Gotcha. Cool. We're in the last few questions here. Thanks again for all your answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's six or seven, so at some point, Sandra's going to come in here and uh, hit me with a uh, shoe. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Um, from Damien, greetings from Colombia. What's your perspective of Latin American animation creators right now? How do you see the current Latin American how do you see the current Latin American animation? Can you please recommend us some names about interesting people in Latin America? Uh, well, I mean, right now, I think Latin America is booming. There's so many cool studios that have been doing amazing work for many years. You know, Alberto in Brazil and, you know, obviously Chile just won an Academy Award recently, uh, uh, Punk Robot. Uh, obviously, Mexico with Mighty is doing amazing stuff. Uh, there's a lot of studios doing incredible work. My, my, my concern in Latin America is story, that there's not a history of writing scripts in Latin America. And so it's been really hard. Uh, I get pitched a lot of stuff. And that's the big problem with a lot of stuff I see. It's like they, the projects look cool, but they, the storytelling is not there. Uh, so I, I encourage all my fellow Latin American creators to take screenwriting classes uh, online as much as they can and just write, write as much as you can. Writing is like drawing. Uh, you can talk about drawing and you can say uh, nice things about drawing, but drawing is drawing and that just <laughs> takes practice. Well, writing is the same. Just because you, you say you know a story, you gotta kind of write it uh, and, and, and write a, you know, and drawing we used to say, it takes a thousand drawings to get to a good drawing. Well, fuck, and writing is the same. You got to write a thousand <laughs> pages yeah. to get to a good page. So that's my encouragement to Latin America. All the information is out there. That's what's great about writing, just like drawing, is just information, and you just have to do it. Anatomy, construction, perspective, this is math. You just have to learn these things. Well, writing is the same. Uh, structure, and, and, and all right. I, I'm going to have to go. <laughs> okay, yeah, no problem. <laughs> that, was, so uh, that was Sandra's cameo. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, this has all been invaluable in, in advice, and, and thanks so much for sharing all of this, Jorge. Uh, this, Nico, this thank, you. thank you so much. And, and <laughs> thank you, uh, everybody who tuned in. Uh, it was a, it was an honor, and, and <laughs> please build... Uh, a ladder from the bones of all of my uh, all my dad stories uh, to get out of this <laughs> to get out of this hole. Thank you so much. Do you want to type in your your um what, what's your Twitter here just so just to plug your uh, your stuff? Sure. I mean, it's the uh, Mixopolis, and it's the uh, you guys can find me on Instagram. There we go. You can yeah. Find me on uh, on uh, Twitter. Uh, if you say really nice things, uh, I can show it to my wife, and she won't get angry that we went over ten minutes. <laughs> no problem <laughs> have a good one thank you so much <laughs> all right bye you guys <laughs>